Writer to Writer, a series on the process and practice of writing, produced by Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Frank Green, your host, and with me today is novelist David Poyer. Thank you for joining us, David. Great to be here, Frank. David, some writers don't know where they'll start when they're writing or where they're going. They just kind of write page by page. Is that how you work? Well, Frank, as I think you know enough about me that, uh, that you know I'm a, a big believer in planning my work and then working my plan. Um, that's not to say inspiration is entirely excluded, but inspiration works best, I think, when it's incorporated within a framework of planning. Well, you have an engineering degree, so I know you, you plan uh, all sorts of things. Has that had an effect on the way you approach your writing? I, I've been accused by some other writers of having an engineering approach to writing fiction, Frank. Um, but actually, I think what I do is something that many writers do. First of all, all writers work differently. And each writer has to find the way that's best for him or her. But the way that makes me feel most comfortable is to have things planned, um, to have uh, to know each day when I'm sitting down what is going to happen that day. You see, a working writer tends to mistrust inspiration. And it's not to say that we can replace inspiration, but we can assist inspiration in many ways with different techniques. Uh, and that makes, it's always very difficult to write. In any way that a writer can make things a little easier for himself, I think that's fair. How do you specifically plan a book? Do you do character sketches? Do you do an outline? Uh, do you lay a keel? Or? <laughs> a keel is good. Well, I do all those things. Um, uh, the character sketches I start with are not as elaborate as some writers do. Most of my character sketches are perhaps three sentences, a paragraph in length. Um, they don't tell very much about the character's appearance or anything like that. Uh, they will generally specify what the character's main challenge or problem will be in the book. Um, the character's name is very important to me, uh, so I spend a good deal of time making sure the name is right, making sure the character understands clearly what the challenges or problems within the book is. Um, as far as the, the plan for the book itself, you mentioned Akeel, and that's very good, because some of the books that I do, such as The Circle and The Gulf and Winter in the Heart, have been books that have five to seven major characters interacting over a lengthy period of time. And if you don't have a very detailed outline, you can really waste some time going down wrong leads, making mistakes, uh, having chronological uh, juxtapositions that don't quite come off uh, I find it saves me a lot of time if I do a detailed plan in advance, first of each character, you know, from start of the book to finish, and then of the other characters, start of the book to finish, and then lay in the points where the characters interact. So that the finished diagram, I do use engineering terminology, and it is a flow diagram of several interrelated processes. And when I put the thing up, it looks fairly impressive, but what it actually is is a very clear skeleton of how the book is going to go. And then the final planning stage that I go through is doing an analysis of the characters in relations to each other. For example, each character, what does he or she want? What do they do to get it? Uh, what prevents them from getting it? How do they react to that? And how does the character braid with other characters, which is a method of analysis that was given to me by my editor, George Whitty at St. Martin's, and which is a wonderful way of clarifying a very complex issue. Well, where do you get your story ideas? The ideas come from many different, many different places. You see, as you know, I, I was a freelancer for many years. Uh, and freelance writing teaches you a lot of good lessons. It's, it's a hard school, but it teaches you thoroughly. 
And one of the things it teaches you is how to recognize a story. You know, we're like Belen whales. As we swim through life, a lot of things pass through our gizzard. But if we have everything arranged right, the good things catch in our, I forget what it's called in a whale, but it's a strainer. And the good story ideas for somebody who's thinking story, as freelance writers always are thinking story, the thing catches in your gizzard and then you take it out. Then I switch to another metaphor. I'm not going to mix my metaphors, but I'll switch to another one. Every time one of those things happen, I visualize it as a bramble. And I take that bramble and I stick it in my pocket. And as days go by and weeks and years, sometimes I'll be able to put my hand in my pocket and pull out a mass of brambles. And what happens is all those story ideas have compacted into a novel. Now I have this mass of ideas that is kind of roughly interlocked. And then I carefully disassemble them again and place them in a logical order. Then I'm able to go to my plan. So where do the ideas come from? They come from a lot of different places. For Stepfather Bank, it was a poet who came into a creative writing class that I was in. Um, for the Med, the Gulf, the Circle, and the Passage, the germs of those were things that actually happened to me in my naval career. Dostoevsky, for example, almost all of his wonderful novels came from articles that he read in the newspaper. So ideas can come from many places, and everyone can have ideas. But the essential thing is to learn to recognize a good story idea. And to do that, I think nothing can really take the place of experience. Well, you, you uh, work a plan, and um, you gather your story ideas. And how did you learn to write? Well, I'm afraid I'm pretty, pretty much self-taught. Um, as I, tell, as I tell people who, who ask me how to learn to write, I say, the first thing you have to realize is that you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, learning to write is like learning to ride a bicycle, except that it takes longer and you get hurt more often. Um, the, uh, I taught myself, as, as I said, I had an engineering degree from Annapolis, and, and then I got another degree in, in, uh, in uh, political science. But those were, aside from teaching me to think and giving me some background in how to plan, those were not really you know, teaching me how to write. Uh, I had to teach myself how to write, and I did it by a self-study program. Uh, and at the same time, of course, I was writing. I read from the beginning of their careers. I picked out about 20 authors um, over the last two centuries whose work I admired, and read everything that he or she had written from the beginning of their careers to the end. And then I read the letters, the biographies. And that gave me a basic familiarity with what good English sounded like. Then I had to write half a million words in order to learn to produce it myself. And that was where freelancing came in, because my early books and my early articles were pretty bad. But gradually, I learned to improve them. It's self-taught. Yes. Um, all, all this kind of planning that, that we've been talking about, uh, did that evolve as a part of the process of writing the 16 novels that you've written, or did, did you plan that heavily in the beginning? Um, let's see. Uh, yes and no. The early books were not planned well. They were sort of planned, but I didn't understand the relationship of planning to creativity then as well as I do now. So I depended more heavily on making things up as I went along, and therefore I wasted a lot of time, and I think the books aren't as, aren't as good as they could be. The later books of the 16 so far that have been published are, I think, well-planned, well-executed, and, um, and they're creative as well, because I've learned to allow room in the, in the planned flow for creation to drop in. And one thing I want to emphasize about these plans is that every couple of chapters, I go back and rewrite the plan in the basis of what has happened in those chapters. So it's not a rigid plan that stays the same throughout the writing of the book. It's always changing. And by the time the book is done, I will easily have 18 different plans and outlines, which I have outgrown. And they lie there like the skins of a snake that the idea has gone through and, and metamorphosed through in the process of writing. Well, does all this planning uh, inhibit the role of inspiration while you're writing? Uh, I think planning can inhibit the role of inspiration, very definitely. But at the same time, it can also make inspiration more accessible. And that, that sounds contradictory, but let me explain. When I'm doing the outline, I'm open to inspiration. And inspiration often enters in during the actual execution of the plan. 
So we leave breathing spaces, we leave gaps there, and we leave critical points, to use engineering terminology, at which the story can change. So, so I'm, I've succeeded, I think, in evolving a method that works for me of having it both ways, so that when I sit down in the morning to do my quota, I know what's going to happen that day. But if what I think is going to happen does not happen, the outline can easily be changed to reflect the better idea that I had while I was actually sitting at the keyboard. We did all this reading, and, and you said you wrote a half a million words. Do you, do you think a young writer just has to get a half a million words out of the way and do a lot of reading? I think there's no other way to become a writer than to read and write. Uh, you cannot be, you cannot, you know, I, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of uh, John Gardner. I got to teach with him a little bit, and he was my idea of what a writer should be. And I, I gained, I think, a sort of psychological support from my relationship with him. But I didn't really pick up anything other than smoking a pipe from John Gardner, you see, by actual contact with him. Right. By reading his books yeah. and by trying to achieve that level of, con uh, le level of quality, that's where I gained. The, so, man is, the man is in his books. Well, the Hindus believe that one attains a mystical energy from actual relationships with holy persons. And I feel a kind of psychological charge when I meet uh, Ray Bradbury, for example. Um, but I don't think in any way that one can learn to write simply from being with someone who knows how to write. The only way to learn a craft is to practice it. And writing, above all and before all, is a craft. Are your plans helpful in selling your work? The plans are synonymous with selling my work, actually. You see, after, after you've published a few books, you have a track record. They know that your books are going to make money for them. Um, the publishers are willing to make deals on the basis of outlines. So that when I'm doing the outline, after the outline is done, it also I put a different cover on it, and it gets turned in as a proposal. The proposal then becomes the subject of prolonged haggling uh, between my agent and uh, the publisher. Uh, out of which I stay. Um, and, uh, and then at the end of that, the end result of that is a contract. Uh, the contract then goes to me for approval or, or rejection, as the case may be. But meanwhile, I'm still working on the outline. So yes, uh, it's helpful in selling the book. And where it's also helpful downstream is in submitting it to, um, to LA for you know, film, um, possible film development. Uh, it's, it's much easier for them to look at an outline of three or four pages than it is for them to read an entire book. Well, how do you get paid for your work? Uh, how is a book actually sold? Uh, I'm thinking of advances and royalties and things like that. The procedure is very different early in your career and later in your career. Early in your career, you're on this endless, endless, you know, sort of, it's like being chased by werewolves on a merry-go-round. Uh, you think you're making progress, but you keep falling off and bumping your head and and it seems endless, but eventually, if you are producing good work, and that's the essential thing, of course, to produce good work, you will find an agent, you will find a home at a publishing house, uh, you will find uh, an audience, and that's the important thing to find, of course. So early on, you're, you just have to have a high tolerance for frustration. Later on, uh, once you've got some successes under your belt and, and uh, can point to a track record, uh, then you can, then you can take the proposal and have your agent go ahead and you know make contracts on that on that basis. As far as were you asking about how do I get paid? Yes. Okay. Uh, generally by check, but sometimes by electronic transfer. I don't, don't mean to pry into <laughs> your your financial transactions, but I I, I think the audience is always curious mm -hmm. about you know how does an author actually get paid? The the, the authors. The author is paid on a royalty basis. The royalty is calculated on a percentage of the cover price. For example, Winter in the Heart, I think, is uh, $22. Um, my, this is all from memory, because I haven't read the contract recently. But I get about 10% of that. So I'm making about $2.30 a book on every hardcover book. Um, on paperbacks, it's slightly different. The royalty rate's a little less, 6 to 8%, something like that. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot. And the retailer, uh, the retailer makes around 40%. The publisher makes uh, maybe 20%. The author is making 8 to 10%. But since you're not involved in all the production of the book, the distribution, you don't have to worry about returns, bookkeeping, anything like that, um, I think that's pretty standard in the industry. 
How do and you structure the agent? The, I'm sorry, the agent takes 10, 10 to 15 right. percent of that, and then the government takes 60 percent of what's remaining. So when you see a million dollar advance, you know maybe the author gets his fingers on 200,000 of that. Well, how do you structure your time, your your daily work time in writing? How do you structure that? How do I structure it? Well, let's see. Um, I work on a quota system, and uh, it's the same system. As I, as I found out last year, that Anthony Trollope used, too. And it's the same number of words per day that Trollope produced. Of course, Trollope was working a full day at the post office, and, and I'm working full time at, at the keyboard, but uh, Trollope produced better than I did. Um, I do about 2,000 words a day. Uh, I try not to do much over that, and I try not to do under that as well, unless I'm in a fairly technical passage, a difficult passage. Then I'll accept 1,000 words a day. But in general, I try to do 2,000 words a day, which is about eight typewritten pages. Um, my books are running from 100 to 200,000 words, so you can work out easily how long it takes me to get to a first draft. Uh, and that's, I do all the research first, then I do a concentrated period of first draft writing. Um, I'm pretty unforgiving on myself producing those 2,000 words. Uh, if it takes me 12 hours to do it, that's what I have to put in. If I do it in six hours, then I have the rest of the day free. Do you work on more than one book at a time? Well, unfortunately, it is necessary to work on more than one book at a time for me. Uh, what happens is I'll finish a book, send it up, uh, changes are suggested. I can either go along with those changes or turn them down, but I respect my editor enough so that most of the changes that, uh, that he recommends uh, I look at seriously because he's been right in the past. He's a good editor. Uh, I respect his his acumen, and um, so I, I often make those changes or or change other or address the same concerns that he's raised in other ways. Then um, then I will have um, see the books progress in different stages, and perhaps I'm in the middle of first draft on one book. I'm doing final revisions on another book, and then in the middle of that, the galleys will come in for a book that's going to come out in two months. I've got to sort of drop everything and do these galleys within 10 days because that's now we're in the production phase of the book, and I can't hold that up. Uh, so I have to hold at least three books. The entire, the entire book has to be in my head, at least three of them at any given time. Well, Witter in the Heart is a very highly polished book. How many drafts did it take you to produce this book? Well, let's see. Winter in the Heart. Um, it's not so easy to count the drafts, actually. Is well, it? actually, I remember it pretty well. And I do remember what changes were in here in each draft. The whole thing was uh, six drafts. The first portion of it is about 10 drafts. Uh, and that's 10 complete rewrites, not counting minor changes. Uh, the ending also had a lot of changes to it. Uh, this is. This is five major characters in this book. It's about um, nursing home scams, toxic waste dumping, teenage suicide, Christian science, and venereal disease in <laughs> western Pennsylvania. It was a very hard book to sell, but, uh, but the, the reviews have been good. But yes, that, that took a lot of polishing because, because I wanted a certain style for this book that was different from the other series of books that I do. And in order to sort of gear myself up for that style, I would read Thomas Hardy a little bit in the morning every day, because that was the sort of style that I wanted to emulate, a very sensory, a very visual style. Um, I think um, Hardy, Hardy is worth emulating. Faulkner is worth emulating. Uh, I have a lot of wonderful writers that I admire. What about the mechanics of your work? Do you use a, a word processing quill? Everybody's real you know, a quail, a word processing quail. Yes, right. You know, it's very good on graphics. Um, this, this seems to be something that everyone's interested in, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's really too, too relevant to the quality of what you produce. Right. Yeah. I do think that, that word processing has helped me uh, make my books better for this reason. Uh, I used to spend loads of time retyping. See, I, I wrote my first book with a fountain pen, my second book with a manual typewriter, my third and fourth, third through fifth with an electric typewriter, and, and since then I've been in word processing. And word processing takes out a lot of the, the grunt work, the endless retyping that used to be an author's lot. Now it's purely creative time, and I like that. 
I think word processors have allowed us to produce better work because more of our time, a larger percentage of our time, goes into things like polishing. And before, a lot of endless hours used to go into just plain typing, which didn't improve the quality of the work that much, if any. How involved are you in, in the actual look of a book and, and the marketing of it? Well, the look, um, I have written into my contracts cover consultation. Um, so so if, a, if a, generally it's the publisher's responsibility to produce the cover and to produce the look of the book, the type script, the typeface, uh, the layout, uh, the end papers, any tip ends, anything like that, cover art. Um, I, I, I try to involve myself early in the process so that I can scream loudly and uh, throw tantrums if something completely unrealistic or unrelated to the book is proposed. But I try not to insert myself into questions of art or typeface or things like that. I feel that the publisher deals with those every day. They're professionals. I can trust them to do a good job. Well. I've dealt with publishers that, you know, we're not that professional, but the publishers I'm with now are. As far as promotion, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask about the marketing and the promotion. Promotion, again, is, is uh, really a matter of choice for the author. You can go out there and promote your book. You can do book signings. You can do television, radio appearances. You can do newspaper interviews. You can talk to writers' conferences. Um, it's really up to you uh, as to how intimate you want to get with your audience, how many hours you want to put in doing that. Uh, I find it's helpful to me to do, um, to do some media work and to do some conferences. The conferences put me in touch with young writers. I'm, I'm involved in helping young writers and beginning writers of all ages. And it also brings you face to face with your audience when you do book signings. I do fewer book signings now than I used to. It's something that, that I think is m that you need to do early in your career to build an audience and to build a sense of rapport with the publisher. But later on, I think it becomes less necessary. Well, your wife, uh, Elizabeth Graves, writes every day. How do you work out uh, living with another writer and both of you writing every day? Well, we both have rooms of our own. <laughs> we both have rooms of one's own. And, uh, and we help each other a lot. Our rooms are not that far apart, and you know, we're always exchanging manuscripts, um, really only after the second draft, because early on, things are still too fluid, and we don't want any negative, uh, any negative impacts or criticism early on in the process. But later on, when we think we've kind of got it the way we wanted it, then I welcome her uh, criticism. She welcomes mine. Um, I take adjectives out of her work. She helps me with my characters. You know, we each have come to, to realize each other's weaknesses and strengths and to, to be symbiotic in, in an effective way. Well, the way uh, you describe writing, it, it sounds rather complex and almost like a job. Uh, are, are there any elements of fun in it? Well, yeah. It is like a job, and I think the more successful you get at it, the more it becomes like a job. But consider this. It's a job. Uh, that you wake up early in the morning every day eager to go to. Uh, it's a job where, you know, your boss may be an SOB and he may always be on your back, but at least you're self-employed. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a job that um, allows you a great deal of freedom in how to do your work and where to do your work. Um, if you're not extensively research dependent, you can go and do your work uh, anywhere in the world. You can do it aboard a boat, sailing down the intercoastal waterway, anything you like. Uh, uh, by the same token, if you're doing a book like Louisiana Blue, which is heavily research dependent, then I can go to New Orleans and, and uh, you know, do some diving, do some, do some um, interviews, do some research on scene. That's fun. You get out of the office, you go out, meet people, meet different people. Um, that's a fun part of the job. So you do a lot of research, do you? My later books have become more and more research dependent simply because I'm branching out. I'm no longer writing purely about things that I've experienced. Um, I think I'm becoming a broader writer in a significant sense. Well, you do a series uh, or three different series of books. Is the process in writing each of those books the same? Well, the three, the three series I do are the Hemlock County series, which is The Dead of Winter, Winter in the Heart, and As the Wolf Loves Winter to date. 
um, the Navy series, which is the Med, the Gulf, the Circle, the Passage to date, and the Diving series, which is you know pretty much for fun, um, Hatteras Blue, Bahamas Blue, and Louisiana Blue. Um, they are different in terms of what I, what I do. The, the diving series, for example, is much more fun for me. It's not, I don't consider it serious fiction, so I go into it and I have some fun writing it. And I try to schedule some travel to some place I'd like to go and incorporate that into the plot um, to get out of the office a little bit, get out, get out on boats. The uh, Navy series I take, I think, are... I try very hard on both the Hemlock County and the Navy series to do the best writing I can do. Although the styles are different, um, I, I work very hard on those. And therefore, I sort of uh, plan a lot and just polish, polish, polish on those. And I kind of let myself go more on the diving, the adventure books. Yes. Well, thank you. This has been Writer to Writer, the process and practice of writing.